today. We are starting something new, starting something uh, that's more than just a new sermon series. Uh, We are picking up essentially where we left off. We are where the disciples were uh, at this point uh, in our reading, in our study. What we've been reading and looking at over the last uh, several, well, last few months, I should say, um, where were the disciples? Uh, they are right where, where we are today. Uh, for the first 90 days of this year, we were reading through the Gospels, right? Uh, we read all four chapters together as a church family of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We spent January, February, and March together. Uh, each of these months, the first quarter of the year, studying through the Gospels. And now, uh, like I said, where were the disciples where we left off there? They had just witnessed the resurrection, right? Uh, Last week, we ended with an investigation into the resurrection of Jesus. That's where uh, the disciples were at the end of our 90 days with Jesus challenge. They were waiting for what was next, right? They were uh, anticipating where they needed to go from here. They were excited about the future. They were, uh, most importantly, confident in the resurrection of Christ now and ready for whatever was next. I hope that's right where we are confident in the resurrection and ready for the next chapter. Now, speaking of chapters, in your Bible, so literally and also chronologically, that next chapter is the book of Acts. All right, that's that's exactly where the church went. That's exactly uh, where we as the church need to go. Um, So we're going to start a new reading plan. I I know the last time we did 90 Days with Jesus, uh, everybody really liked doing the the reading and following along together and knowing that your brothers and sisters here at Liberty are reading the same thing uh, exactly on that day, the exact same thing that you're reading on that day. And so we're going to go right into, because I've heard it again this time, uh, another reading plan that that we've put together where we're all going to read the same thing on the same day. By all means, do whatever studies you guys are working on in your private time and that you would normally do. Just add these chapters, uh, a chapter each one of these days. We're going to have a schedule. Uh, We're going to have a new reading plan. We're going to have a sermon series and Sunday night lessons now that are going to take us all the way through the book of Acts together. Um, It's called the Unstoppable Church. Uh, Just like our last immersive experience, I want to highly encourage you to participate in this, uh, to, to do what you have to do to get the most out of this, because the book of Acts is such an important book for the Christian, such an important book for the church. It's a history of how the Lord's church was started, how the Lord's uh, church was was established, how it spread, and how it is indeed unstoppable. It was, it is, and it always will be. And so to help us stay on track together, we do have some some books again. Uh, We're going to put those in the back uh, before you leave today. We'll get those back there. Be sure you grab one of those. I think I don't have to say this, but I will. Obviously, it's free. It's just instead of stapling them together, uh, now that we have the ability to bind books and stuff, you know, well, we made a book, okay? So, so grab that. It's nothing fancy, uh, but get a hold of it so you've got the reading plan there. You'll have that book so you can follow along. It's got study questions in it. So uh, first of all, there's a schedule. Then as you go back, there's questions to kind of, again, keep yourself honest, test you to make sure that, you know, you, you recall what you've read. You didn't zone out, you know, you're like, you, you hit a question and you're like, hmm, what was that? And then you go back, like, ah, I missed that when I read it. So those questions are important. So you have that booklet to work through on a daily basis. We'll also get together on Sundays and we'll have a Sunday morning sermon that will, just like 90 Days with Jesus, uh, go back to, it'll come from the reading that you did over the previous week. And uh, on top of that, our Sunday night study, uh, very similar to what we've been doing. It will also come from the reading. The, 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 kind of difference here is that it will highly emphasize just multiple moments in your reading from the last week of how the church was unstoppable. So there's a lot of things you're going to see in the book of Acts, but what we're going to highlight, especially on Sunday nights, what we're going to emphasize is just looking at examples, multiple examples of of different places that you read, some of which you might miss. Some of which you, we might not bring up and you might say, hey, what about this? And we'll talk about those things on Sunday nights. Ways that we saw, ah, the church just could not be stopped. There, there was no excuse, you know, hey, we should, we, should, we should stop or we should slow down. No, 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 the church was pressing on in this instance and in that instance and in this instance. And, and, and that's what we're going to do 
on Sunday nights. If we all participate in this uh, morning, Sunday morning, if we all come back on Sunday night, and if we all do the reading and the study questions during the week, uh, I'm telling you, this could completely transform our congregation. This experience is going to show us that the unstoppable church that we see in the book of Acts is you and me, right? We are, in fact, the unstoppable church, or so we should be, all right? So we're going to learn about it. We're going to uh, encourage ourselves, build ourselves up, and create some confidence, but also see the reality of not just, you know, hey, we're unstoppable, raw, let's go. No, let's see why and how, and let's, get, let's gain confidence in the fact that the Lord's church is unstoppable, and then I think we will be. <laughs> I think we will be, okay? So let's get started uh, with this, morning, this morning's message. That's, that's the talk about what we're starting. Uh, let's get into the message. If you were to take a road trip uh, out into you know, the, the southwestern part of these here United States of America, uh, you would come across... There, there are some areas that, you know, you can drive for even hundreds of miles and, and not see really a whole lot of green. You'll, you'll see mostly desert-type um, areas, um, landscapes of beige and gray and red and brown, you know, rocks, uh, bushes maybe that, that kind of look like they've been abused by the sun. I mean, mostly rough stuff. And I mean, you can go, like I said, miles and miles and miles in some areas of the country down there. Th that, that's all you'll see. And then kind of out of nowhere, seemingly, uh, you'll come across, you'll see off in the distance, this sort of cluster, a refreshing cluster of nice, lush, green trees, a, a vivid contrast to everything else that, that you've seen out there. Uh, life, uh, suddenly, out of nowhere, you see life that can be seen by the green, by the fruit. It, it's, it's a, like I said, quite a contrast. And in a sense, you probably know where I'm going with this, in a very basic sense, this illustrates, I mean, vividly, you can see it illustrates for us kind of what the church is like in the midst of the world, all right? This morning, I want to bring you a message called Being Unstoppable, okay? This is just kind of an introductory message called Being Unstoppable. Think about it. We're in the desert. Everything around us is diseased and dying, scorched by the sting of sin. The world cries out over everything that they see as, as difficulty, everything that they see as, as hard and, and a struggle, um, broken relationships, financial struggles, financial collapse in the, the economies around the world, sickness, depression, addiction, lack of purpose. You know, yet here stands the church in the midst of it, vibrant and green, if you will, in the middle of all this, and despite all of this, still producing fruit, still uh, alive and well, right? And, and when we walk up to this church and we look and see how it is that she's surviving, how it is that she's more than surviving, thriving, flourishing in the midst of all this, we're going to see that the reason is very similar to those green trees out in the middle of the desert. The church She's connected to that life-giving source. She is uh, very, uh, very much rooted in and connected to a life-giving source of water, but it's a special kind of water. Remember in John chapter 4, in verses 13 and 14, Jesus, we know who he was talking to, right? He was talking to the woman at the well, an actual well, literally a well with literal water. He's talking to her, and it says, Jesus answered her and said, uh, Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water, okay, the water in the well, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. The water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Today, as we kick off this unstoppable church experience, we're going to see that the church was originally designed to be unstoppable, that she is indeed unstoppable, wasn't just designed but became that is unstoppable, that we get to be part of that unstoppable church, and that the church is unstoppable because it's connected to, because it has this association with the source of life, right? That's why it's unstoppable. So let's start right on into this. Let's start by looking at the fact that the church is unstoppable by design. I won't bore you with a long list of definitions of uh, the word design, uh, but suffice it to say, all the definitions that you're going to find uh, about what the word design means are going to have something to do with plans and planning. 
And that's exactly what God has done as he's designed his church. He planned it this way. He planned it to be unstoppable. He designed the church. He planned the church. And his design for the church is for it to be unstoppable, to have no weaknesses, no fault, nothing to overcome it whatsoever. Remember in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. It's a familiar passage to us, right? We, we quote this, and we bring this up for a variety of reasons in discussions and debates. There's, there's lots of reason to talk about this, so we're familiar with it. But what I want us to see this morning and to notice here is that before the church was truly established, okay, it was already planned, it was already designed, it was a sure thing, but I'm saying before it was truly established, back in the Gospels, we're reading of Jesus here, uh, before his death, before his burial, before his resurrection, he already knew and he already announced that his church, the church he was working on, that he was building, that he was going to establish, would be unstoppable. Nothing would overpower. He pre-announced that even the gates of Hades would not overpower. It would not prevail against it. Now, some of you might be reading a version that says the gates of hell will not overpower it. Now, of course, it is a, a true statement. There are no uh, gates of hell that are going to overcome the church for sure. But this word would be more accurately translated as Hades, right? The, the abode of the dead, the place of departed souls. So what's Jesus saying? You know, let's not get lost in the weeds. What's Jesus getting at here? What's, what's the context telling us? What does he mean? He is saying that not even death can stop the church. Nothing can stop the church, not even death. The, the one thing that you say, well, what's the worst that could happen, you know? You know but did you die? You know, you, all these kinds of things. You know, death is the ultimate, right? He says not even that can overpower it. The, the power of death is not enough to overcome the church. It's what Jesus is saying. The church, again, is designed this way, designed to be unstoppable. So it doesn't matter if we go through another pandemic. It doesn't matter if you've got some strained, difficult relationships in your life, uh, the, the flawed political systems that we have to deal with, uh, financial constraints that we all have to manage, uh, sickness that we all go through, unemployment that we might face, direct opposition, persecution, even death itself. The church was designed so that none of these things will stop it. None of these things will overcome it. So again, the church is unstoppable by design. Secondly, I want us to see that the church is unstoppable in action. The church is unstoppable in action, okay? When the church is in action, that's when she is unstoppable. Listen to Jesus' words to his apostles in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Another familiar passage. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, those words I know, you probably know as well, were spoken specifically to his apostles. But the work of being witnesses to the world for the Lord, that's the responsibility of every single member of the Lord's church. That's on every single one of us. In Matthew chapter 28, uh, we know at the end of that chapter, Jesus gives uh, what he calls the great, or what we call the great commission. He's commissioning his disciples to go out and do the work that he has for the church to do. The work that he wants the church to do and has commanded us to do. And what does he tell them there? He tells, us, uh, he tells his disciples there to go and make disciples of all the nations, to baptize them, and to teach them everything that he has commanded them. You hear that? That last part's important. To also, to, so to go make disciples, baptize them, and also to teach them everything he's commanded them. Well, one of those commands was to go and preach, right? So if they're going to teach what he's commanded, they're going to teach them to go and preach, right? Go and preach the gospel. Go and make disciples of the whole world. For these disciples, I hope you see it, for these disciples to obey the Lord here in this command, to obey what he's called them to do, every aspect of it, not just make disciples, not just baptize them, but to continue to teach them. For them to obey, they're going to have to teach them everything they've been taught, obviously. So they're going to have to teach them to go, to preach, to make disciples as well. So it's, it's a cycle thing. So some people will argue, well, that was just for the apostles. He was just telling those people on that hill that day. No, no, no. But look, if they obeyed the command, they would be teaching them to do everything that Jesus had taught, which would be 
go make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. So, so it's for every single one of us. But here's where it gets really good. When we obey, when we as the church obey the Lord's command to spread his word far and wide, we are going to be unstoppable in that. The church is unstoppable in action, like we said. When we do what we've been called to do, we don't have to fear failure. I'm not going to say there aren't going to be moments where we sense or, or suppose that we failed in some way. I'm not saying that, but it's not something we need to fear because if we're doing what he's called us to do, we have confidence. We know that his word doesn't fail. Listen to this. Listen to what God himself is recorded as saying in Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 13. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. Now, pause. Did you hear the picture and then the so shall my word be? I don't want you to miss it. Let, let's read it again. Look at verse 10. For as the rain, so understand, this is the way it works, right? For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth. Okay, can rain and snow fall on the earth without creating moisture on the ground? No. Pretty sure thing, right? And they don't return without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Does that happen? Yeah, pretty sure thing, right? Now, verse 11, so will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. This is God speaking. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you and all the trees of the field, field will clap their hands Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. Instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up. And it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. Now, isn't that a beautiful picture of the power of our God and of his word? This should give us great confidence, great reassurance, great peace, knowing that this is the power of our God, the power of his word. Church, it's interesting to, to, to point out, to recall, we all know it, but God spoke through the patriarchs, through the prophets, and they spoke through our propitiation, Jesus Christ, and now he has made us his mouthpiece. The church, he has entrusted his word to us to go and spread, to go and accomplish what he desires with his word. We are the sower, but we're sowing his Seed, And it is to accomplish, to sprout and bear forth what he has meant for it too. He's entrusted to us. His word, he says, will not return to him empty without accomplishing what he desires. Maybe not what we want, but what he wants for sure. Without succeeding, he says, in the matter for which he sent it. This doesn't mean that every time you, you uh, speak God's word, people are just going to fall in line and follow you. People are just going to fall in line, you know, practically bow down to you and tell you, yes, absolutely, I believe, and, and you're going to see them start obeying it right then and there perfectly. That's not necessarily what's going to happen. Instead, what we get here is that, that we can know that if we faithfully proclaim God's word, it's going to accomplish what God desires. Okay, we need to have confidence and trust in that. Our, our opinion, our hopes, our plans, not that important. Okay? I mean, if they align with God's, that's great. But, but why is that significant? Because of what God wants. When we align our will with his, that's what's significant, is that we're in line with him. What he wants to be accomplished, his desires, his will, that's what's important. And we can know, we can have confidence that when we faithfully proclaim his word, it's going to accomplish what he desires. If we're faithful in action, if we do what he says to do, we know that he's accomplishing something. His word is succeeding. That much is a fact. And so, again, like we said, the church is unstoppable 
in action. And I'm excited as we go through, this is just a, again, an introductory message, kind of a little survey and a, a build you up you know, booster to get you excited. As we go through this study over these next several weeks, this is a fact you won't be able to miss. Because there's going to be a lot of action and you're going to see the church overcome a lot of stuff. And I, it's going to be a blast. I'm excited. I hope you get excited too. Next thing, let's move on. Next thing, I, I want you to understand that we are unstoppable as members. It's significant that we get to be a part of this. We get to be members of this unstoppable force, okay? Uh, we read Matthew 16, 18 earlier. I want to back up a couple verses there and, and look also starting at Matthew 16, verse 16 here. It says, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So that's what Peter said. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Okay, you remember this. Peter made this, this good confession, stating this foundational truth that Jesus is in fact the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. And on that foundation, on that bedrock truth, Jesus said he's going to build his church. He's going to build his church. Nothing's going to overpower it. He said he'd do that, and he did. And then what do we see happening in the, in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament? We see those who truly did believe that. Those who understood, believed, and trusted in that, that bedrock foundational truth, they were added to the Lord's church. The Lord added them to his church. They became members of the Lord's church. His church is unstoppable, and he has made it possible that we can become part of that. It'd be great to be witnesses of it. It'd be great to get to, to see it in action. We get to be part of it. We get to be members of the unstoppable. And again, let me tell you, this book is full of excitement, full of action. But this book is also where you're going to learn how to become part of it. This book is how we learn how to become part of the Lord's Unstoppable Church. As we go through this experience together over the next several weeks, we're going to see very clearly how to get into it, how to become part of it, how to know for certain that you are part of the unstoppable, that that's what you're involved in and not something else, okay? We're going to see in Acts chapter 2 that the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. We're going to see that it's the Lord who has granted and who does grant the opportunity to be a member to be part of his church. It's not me, it's not you, it's not the, the church here, it's the Lord who does that, who, who transfers us from the domain of darkness to, to his kingdom, puts us in there, okay? And, and you know why that's a big deal? There are a number of reasons, and we could come up with all kinds of reasons that it's a big deal that, that he puts us in and we get to be part of that church. And, and I, don't think we could, I don't think we could fathom them all or put them into a single sermon, but I think Paul sort of sums up the big deal for us about being a member of the Lord's church when he says in Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For that to be true, that means being part of the Lord's church, being a member of what he's created is a pretty powerful thing. Again, to, to live is Christ. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to, I'm going to love him right here and do all that I can right where I am. And to die is just better, even better. Okay, here it's wonderful. Beyond, it's even better. Uh, this is a powerful thing. And this isn't just some special confidence that's exclusively available to, to an apostle, like, like Paul who's writing this. This is available to all who are members of the Lord's church. Paul said it over in Romans 8, 31 like this. He said, if God is for us, who is against us? Right? If God is for us, who is against us? Now, you got to be careful saying that. If we think, if we're talking literally, there's a lot of people against us, right? There's a lot of people who in error and foolishly set themselves in opposition to the Lord and to his church. Absolutely. But Paul isn't talking about that. Paul isn't being uh, in, in, completely literal in what he says here. Instead, what Paul's doing is he's talking about the power here. He, he's making an appraisal of the power of the threat versus the power of being on the Lord's side, right? If God is for us, okay, if we've got that power on our side, we're on his side, I should say, then what is the, the, what is the, the reality of the threat? What is the power of the threat? It's like it's nothing. It, it's, it's like being able to say, 
who is against us? <laughs> you know, you look around, you know, who can stop us, right? That sort of thing. N nobody. Absolutely nobody. Um, think back to last week. Jesus rose from the dead, won victory over sin and death. We looked at that, and you remember where we started today. Jesus said the church that he's building would be unstoppable. It is. Not even death can overcome it. it. It's powerful. It's a powerful thing to be a member of the unstoppable church because even when death, physical death, comes knocking on the door, we can be at peace because we know what's next. We know and have confidence and trust in what the Lord said is next. In fact, the Apostle Paul is the one who told us, uh, it just beautifully and delicately puts it, that, that we're supposed to use this information to comfort each other, right? Remember this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? He said, this, this, this stuff is true, and we need to remember to encourage each other with this information, right? He said, <coughs> in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, he says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. So he's talking about other people who are members of the Lord's church, who, who are in on this wonderful, powerful uh, promise here. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. You see right there already, there's, there's power in getting to be part of, getting to be a member of the Lord's church because there are those who have what? Not as much hope. They have no hope, it says. But that's not us. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, there's that bedrock foundational truth again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. So this is the truth. This is God's word. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have, fallen, who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And I love this. And so we shall always be with the Lord. You don't have to worry about, um, you know, well, what's going to happen? Is there, is there going to be a moment where, you know, he's going to call us up, but then he's going to be like, okay, guys, here's the game plan. I just need you, you know, for a, for a thousand literal years to go down here and, and do battle with swords and helmets against a literal serpent, you know. Like, no, he says when he calls us to go and be with him, when he calls time and says it's over, and he brings his to be with him, so we shall always be with the Lord. That's comforting. There's not going to be any surprises. Not going to be any surprises. We shall always be with the Lord. And then verse 18, there, there it is. He says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Being a member of the church comes with this kind of hope. Right? There are those who have no hope. But we are those who have this hope. This kind of promise, this kind of reward promised to us that we can trust in, that we can believe in, and that, that we can put our hope in. It is our hope. We're unstoppable, and we're members of it. If we believe Jesus is crucified, risen Son of God, and we follow through with a faithful life, even the grave cannot, will not stop us, and we get to be part of that. That's amazing. Last thing. Final point, and I'll make it very quickly. We're unstoppable by association. It's important to point out, um, I mean, we've already said even the grave can't stop us, but it's important to point out that there's a very important reason why. It's not something we've done. It's not something we can do. Um, it's something that's been done for us by only one who could, right? The Apostle Paul describes how Jesus took care of our grave problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23. He says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming. So Jesus made this possible. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, Paul also tells us that, that our Savior, Jesus Christ, he says he's done something very important. He says he's abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Anybody on earth able to do that? Any of us able to just abolish it? Be like, you know what? I don't, I'm not a big fan of that death thing. I think I'm just going to abolish it. From now on, I hereby decree no more death. No, none of us can do that. But Jesus was able and did do that. And he brought immortality, it says, to light. And it was through the gospel. 
You've heard of being guilty by association, right? You've heard that phrase. Well, as members of the Lord's church, we've been made unstoppable by association. But it requires a, a special association, right? Um, in Genesis chapter 3, after um, Adam and Eve sinned, God had a number of things to say about what the future was going to look like, what was going to happen in the future. And as he was speaking to Satan, he told him in Genesis 3.15, he says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and you shall, listen to this, you shall bruise him on the head, or I'm sorry, he shall bruise you on the head, and you, speaking to Satan, you shall bruise him on the heel. This was the official announcement straight from God that there was going to be a generations-long battle between darkness and light, between good and evil, Satan and mankind, uh, her seed and his seed, it says, talking about Satan's, okay? Folks, when we put our faith in Christ and completely surrender every aspect of ourselves, our will, our lives to him, we find ourselves on the side, associated with, if you want to say it that way, we find ourselves on the side of the battle that the Lord said is going to deliver the death blow. Look at what's going on here. There's a special emphasis that I, that I put on when I read it uh, after I made the mistake of reading it wrong um, on the fact that there's going to be a head blow and a blow to the heel. I want you to picture this. Satan gets hit in the head. As he's falling... All he gets is a bruise on the heel. He gets, he gets one swipe at the heel. Who win, who's winning that battle? The Lord, right? The seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. He's the one that, boom, right to the head of Satan. And as Satan is falling, he gets, he gets a, 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 what is equivalent to a bruise on the heel. Does it create pain? Does it make things inconvenient? Uh, little Molly, you guys, Tuesday night, you know, she, she hurt her foot doing, uh, what do you, anybody want to guess? Cartwheels in the basement. Yeah, yeah, Earl's up here doing, his, that's exactly right. You know, she hurt her little foot and it's pretty rough, you know. But I'm not concerned about this being the end. You know, we're like, oh, she's going to be okay. Her foot's going to heal, that nasty bruise is going to go away and we can all quit going, ah, every time she takes her socks off, you know. It's going to be okay. Bruise on the heel, no big deal. Bruise of the head, we've got some serious things we need to consider here. The Lord is winning, and we need to be associated with him. He's done that work. He's the one who could deliver that death blow, that head shot, and we need to be on his side because he's winning this war. We are unstoppable only when we are associated with the resurrected Christ. There's no other way. We have to be with him on his side, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the eternally victorious Savior of the world that we celebrated last week for sure. So, again... This morning, guys, all this message is for, a little different than normal, all this message is for is to pump you up about this, to get you excited about uh, what's coming in the book of Acts, because we barely touched it. We talked about things leading up to it. What we're going to look at next week, starting next week, is going to be right into the history of the church, the action, how it started, how it got going what this book was written for. I mean, just all kinds of exciting information. And so the goal today was just to whet your appetite for participation in this unstoppable church experience by showing you that the church is unstoppable by design. That it's unstoppable in action, when, when we're busy doing what we're called to do, that we're unstoppable as members. We get to be part of this unstoppable thing and that the church is unstoppable by its association with Christ. He's the risen Lord. He's the one who paid the price. It chose to go through with the plan and has made all of this possible for us. All the action, all the excitement, all the victory, the promises, everything that we're going to see, everything that we get to participate in, it's all because of Jesus, and he doesn't go away in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm.